Hi, I'm Seth, and I am really afraid of failure, but I'm even more afraid of success. Welcome to the good world. One, two, three. So come on in to a place that is fun. Place that is fun. I'll be your friend and you can be mine. Can be the fun. world is a stream of constant bullshit. But that doesn't mean there's not a whole lot of good shit. It's nothing to me and we can make something different. Let's build a world that is good. This is a show for adults. Hello. Welcome. My name is Seth. I don't know what I'm going to say, so we'll figure it out together. Maybe it'll be interesting. Hopefully it won't be terrible. Uh, so I was talking last week with um, his official title is he's my spiritual director, which is not a thing that I grew up with uh, as a Reformed Jew growing up, um, but is basically sort of a therapist with a spiritual dimension. Uh, but it's a requirement for my school that I that I talk to someone who can be sort of a guide. Uh, and we were talking about this, this show that you're here watching right now. And I, I was reflecting on what I am trying to do with it and what I'm trying to get out of it. Um, and I think that is a question that a lot of people who know me personally really don't know the answer to. Oop. That's uh, that's just me getting a phone call from Walgreens that I have a prescription ready. Let me get rid of that. The the magic of live streaming, live uh, it's not television, live video. Uh, sometimes you get a call to let you know that your antidepressants are ready. Hey, yeah, brains. Um, so, uh, so yes. I think a lot of people who are important in my life don't really understand what I'm doing um, because uh, about four years ago, I left what was a pretty successful career uh, in in the world of data analytics and, and political data. Uh, I did political polling and predictive modeling, which is a thing I could talk about for a long time, but it's, it's pretty boring, I think, to most people. Um, but I did grab... Oh, wait, do I... It, it went away. Uh, I have a picture that I wanted to share to sort of, um, this was like the peak of my career uh, as, a, as a political data analyst. Can I get this to show me also? I can't. Uh, but over here on the right of your screen, see there's like the side of a face with a beard. That's my face side. That is the side of my face. Here, we'll hide it again. See, so I'm like over, I'm over here facing this way. Face side. Uh, so that was me. And that picture is from Time Magazine, which is still, it's still a little insane to me that my picture was in Time Magazine. And it's obviously not just a picture of me, uh, but sort of the peak of my career uh, was in 2012 when I worked on the Obama campaign and I worked in analytics and it was it, it was sort of a new thing that we were doing and it was really exciting. Uh, and I was the way that I often describe that job is there were, I think, 55 people on that team. And I was somewhere around the 55th smartest. Um, it was a room full of really, really brilliant people. Uh, and it was it was amazing. And I thought, OK, well, this is going to this is going to launch me on a whole career. And I went and I worked in politics for uh, eight more years. And I eventually got really fed up and I sort of threw up my hands and I was like, I don't want to do this anymore because there is such, for anyone who is working professionally in politics, there is such a strong incentive. You need to be able to make money and the people who have the money don't really want to pay you to tell them the things they don't want to hear. And if you're a data scientist, a lot of your job is sort of looking at things and saying, yeah, there's actually no evidence for the thing that you want to believe. And and people don't like that. They, they, they often say they do, but when it comes time to hire you again and pay you again, they might look for someone else. Uh, and so I found myself in this position where I was like, okay, well, I either have to kind of bullshit about 
what I can do or I can stop working here. And so I decided to stop working there. And I... I left and I was like, um, I don't know, maybe I'll start a YouTube show. I used to, when I was younger, I, I did a lot of theater. I did improv comedy. And so I have, I have that muscle somewhere, the, men, the mental muscle, the mental muscle somewhere in my brain. Uh, and I, I, it's rusty. I'm still a, a little slow. I haven't been doing this that much, but I decided I would, I would sort of get on camera and just talk. Uh, about what I see in the world, what my experiences are. I've had enough conversations with people who are like, oh, that's an interesting thing. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe more people want to hear me say these things that I think are interesting, at the very least. And I sort of look out at media and I see, I don't I don't fully see my perspective represented. There are bits and pieces here and there. Um, and I certainly don't see my perspective represented in sort of mainstream politics and political discourse. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to never use the, the word discourse again. But so I, I decided I would do this. And then uh, Susie, uh, my, my spouse, and I, we moved to California uh, from Washington, D.C., where we were living. And I sort of started recording, like, as I was taking my dog, Charlie, to the dog park. And I got into a little bit of a rhythm, and then we moved to now we're in Sacramento. We were up in the foothills in Grass Valley uh, and moving got me totally out of my rhythm. And then I decided that I wanted to go to interfaith seminary, which is a whole other thing to talk about. But I ended up putting all of my attention into that. It's very, very hard for me as someone with, uh, I'm certain that a lot of other people watching this have ADHD. Um, but it's very hard for me to sort of have more than one big project at a time. So I put all of my attention into school and, and I sort of put this on the back burner, but then also by, by stopping recording and, and putting this channel on the back burner, I got another special little thing out of it, which is I got to avoid any risk of failure. And as I said at the top, any risk of success, I have some fear of both of those. I actually, I, I would say maybe I have a lot of fear of both of those. Uh, and I think the longer, it's now been four years since I stopped working in politics. And I think the longer that this goes, where this is a, a channel that gets like 10 views an episode or, or whatever it is at this point, it's not very many. Uh, the longer that goes without my getting... 50, 100, 1,000, 10,000, you know, some much larger number of people to watch this, that feels like I have failed. And the more time passes, the more it's like, oh, Seth was just having a midlife crisis. And to be clear, I was, and I think probably still am, kind of having a midlife crisis because I'm 42 and, like, the world is on fire and there's a lot of war and murder and it's really not great. And I'm like, okay, I'm 42. I like, I know more than I did when I was 25 or 30, but I, I, I'm still learning. I think probably I will still be learning up until, you know, even if I live to be a hundred, uh, which I, I would be surprised, but it's possible. Uh, and even if I live to be a hundred, I don't think th that I will ever stop learning. Uh, I know it's cheesy, but it's true. It's true. And, uh, so, so the more time that passes without success, the more I feel like a, a, a failure and the more that I sort of worry about what the people in my life will think. And so I was talking with my, my spiritual director about this and I had this memory of when I was in high school and in high school, I was, I was terrible at doing homework. I was very good at tests. I was good at writing papers. Uh, I did a lot of theater. So that was sort of where like a lot of my energy was directed into acting in the different school plays. I had things that I was good at. Homework was not one of them. I had one class where we were required to take notes on the reading every day and then turn our notebooks in. And I literally never did it the entire year. And the teacher initially started out by by saying, OK, it's going to be a surprise uh, and I won't tell you. And then you'll just you'll have to have your notebook ready. And then as the year went by, she started changing it and was like, OK, 
I'm going to collect your notebooks next week. So you would think with a deadline, maybe I'd be able to do it. No, not able to do it. Terrible at homework. That sound means it's time to take a break. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Please like and subscribe. 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 Yeah, we're back. <laughs> That's it. I don't have I don't have ads. I don't have a lot of people who watch this. Uh, it's just you and, and me here. I'm I'm in my shed behind my house. Anyway. Terrible at doing homework. Good at tests. And so that one way that that manifested itself is I did very well on the SATs. Uh, and I'm not trying to brag because I don't actually think that doing well on the SATs is... It's, it's, it's a specific skill that you can train for, and I was trained for it. I had separate tutors for English and math. So, like, I was... I, I was trained and targeted to do well on the SATs, and so I did well on the SATs. And I remember I, I got my score, and uh, I remember one of my classmates hearing it, and so I, I guess I should say the number, I got a 1590 out of 1600, which is a good score. I did have a roommate in college who got a 1600 uh, and laughed at me a lot, but that's a, that's a whole separate thing. Um, so I got my, my SAT score, and I remember my classmate saying to me, you are such a waste of potential. And I, at that point, was like 17, maybe 16. I don't remember exactly when I took the SATs, but like that's, a, that's quite a thing. And I'm not, I'm not angry at her. I don't blame her. It was, it was part of the narrative that all of us had drilled into our head was that we had to achieve, achieve, achieve. And, and so I... We all thought that's all we had to do. And so when she said I was a waste of potential, she was reflecting a thing that I thought myself and that a lot of people around me thought. They were like, oh, Seth could do so much if only he could sort of direct his energies. Uh, and so a thing that felt really nice for me about that job in 2012 and the attention that came with it and the professional success, which is a word I have a I, I don't love it. I'll just put it that way. I think it's, I think we talk about success like it's, I could do a whole other episode about it, but the, the short version of it is, it's like, it's not quite the same as calling someone who wins a coin flip a success, but like there's a lot of stuff going into it and we're just like, oh, this person wins at life and this other person loses at life and that's nonsense. So uh, I, I was a waste of potential. And then when I, was in Time Magazine, I suddenly had fulfilled all my potential. And everyone who knew me was like, oh, it's so great to see you succeeding and like putting your energy into the thing you want to be doing because, you know, it's it's just great. And a lot of that, by the way, is the ADHD thing where I can like really hyper focus. So I worked really hard on that campaign because I, I got obsessive about it. Uh, which I'm sure has nothing to do with the fact that I was avoiding the negative feelings from my parents' divorce, which was very fresh at that point. Definitely wasn't about avoiding all of those negative feelings. It was just, it was just focusing. Um, so I have this idea of success or failure, and I had this moment of success, and now it's 12 years later, and now... I, am I a failure because I haven't recorded a lot of episodes and I don't get a lot of viewers? There are certainly people who would say yes. But part of what I've been doing is avoiding starting. And part of what I'm doing now is trying to get into the habit of just making stuff and putting it out there because, because what, what I care about at this point is just doing the thing. But why I was avoiding starting was the fear of failure and also the fear of success. Because if I'm a failure, everyone thinks I'm a failure, and that feels bad. Uh, and there's, I have 42 years of experience being told that I'm supposed to have a certain version of success that looks like a specific thing, uh, and and I, I don't have that. Uh, but I'm also, as I said, I'm avoiding success, and I haven't even gotten to that, so now I'll get to it. 
I'm avoiding success because I don't, I don't love attention, which is a weird thing to say when you're recording something to put on the internet. Uh, and also a weird thing to say, given my long background as both an actor and a, a comedian and improv, I did a lot of performance in a lot of different ways. But when I think back on that, I think I, in those contexts, I sort of, for acting especially, you're not being yourself, you're being a character. And so the attention I got was, oh, Seth portrayed someone else very well. And what was nice about that is I didn't have to worry about what people thought about me. Because whatever they thought, it wasn't about me. It was just about the character I was playing in a play. Uh, and I played some, you know, very charming and lovable characters. And I played some jerks. And I was pretty good at it. And, and so people would say, oh, you did so well, instead of, oh, you're such a jerk. Uh, they do tend to, if you're playing a charming character, people do kind of tend to, like, transpose that. Um, but I was, I was just avoiding any, any revealing of my true self. I wasn't talking about me and who I am. And I, in fact, remember very clearly, I, I was so desperate to be in a relationship for all of high school, much of college. I eventually was in a relationship in college, but up until that point, I was just desperate to feel loved, honestly, and to feel validated. Uh, and that desperation did not go great, it turns out. Um, but I, who having an ADHD, like train of thought went away. Uh, I, I was just seeking that validation. Oh, I remember. So, so when people give romantic advice, they often say, just be yourself. And I remember very clearly thinking, what does that mean? How am I supposed to know what being myself means? Un and, and genuinely, I think I thought, unless I try out a lot of different personas and just pick the one that people respond positively to, how else am I supposed to be myself? What does that even mean? And so now, 20 years later, I, I kind of have a pretty good sense of who I am. And part of that was that I stopped acting because I was using acting as a way to avoid things. But so now I'm here, and when I say I have a fear of success, it's really because I have this, this inner part of me that is afraid of people looking at me and evaluating me. And, you know, look, if this goes well, then... The internet is not a place where people are conventionally very nice to each other if they disagree, and no one is going to agree with everything that I say. Uh, and if everyone does agree with everything that I say, then, like, I'm not saying anything interesting. So some people will probably get mad, and internet comments can be rough, and so I'm just very afraid of of this feeling of being evaluated if I succeed. But simultaneously, there is a part of me that's going to be like, ha ha, I showed you this is the person I was supposed to be all along. I am not a waste of potential. Here at the age of 42, I am fulfilling my potential by making videos on the internet and and posting them for people to watch. Like that's, if if a lot of people watch it, then I'm a success. If a lot of people don't watch it, then I'm a failure. And so what I'm trying to practice now is not thinking that either of those things is real. Like I, the, the narratives exist and I'm, I'm not going to pretend they don't, but at the end of the day, it's also really important to recognize that they're, they are just narratives, right? I can do a lot of things to avoid feeling bad but that's not actually a healthy way to live. Uh, something that I that I posted about uh, just yesterday on my Instagram. Uh, I don't think it is on my official Facebook channel, uh, though maybe I'll put it there after this. I went last week to a concert. Uh, we went to see Dinosaur Jr. and the Flaming Lips and uh, Weezer. It was the 30th anniversary of Weezer's Blue Album, which, if you grew up in the 90s, was a big deal. Uh, and the Flaming Lips have always been one of my favorite bands. And they have this song, Do You Realize, which is a great song. And 
So the lyrics are, do you realize you have the most beautiful face? Do you realize we're floating in space? Do you realize that happiness makes you cry? Do you realize that everyone you know someday will die? But instead of saying all of your goodbyes, let them know you realize that life goes fast. It's hard to make the good things last. You realize the sun doesn't go down. It's just an illusion caused by the world spinning round. And I have been listening to that song for over 20 years. And standing at that concert at the Golden One Center here in Sacramento, California, uh, on, uh, on, on the ancestral land of the Miwok people, we can do that. Um, standing there in Golden One Center, I was really struck by this song and, the, and just the power of that message. You know, when I was 22, I didn't really appreciate the idea, yeah, all of this is temporary. And now I'm, I'm 42 and I've, I have aged plenty. My friends have aged. My parents have aged. Uh, my grandparents are all dead. And, and I have some, I have been fortunate not to have any close friends that have died, but I've had a number of my peers and friends who have died. And things in my life have changed, right? I had, I had this moment in 2012 where I thought I was, uh, everything was going great. And, and then it sort of turned into something that I didn't like as much. Everything is temporary. And that's not a new insight, right? That is a foundational insight from Buddhism is the idea of impermanence. Everything is impermanent. Your body is in, impermanent. Our, our families, our pets, the trees outside our house, the planet will at some point, it's not going to be for a while, but will at some point get swallowed by the sun. And, or, or you know, maybe like a giant asteroid will come and hit the Earth, maybe even a long time after all of us are gone. But everything that is here that we think of as being part of our lives, all of it is impermanent. And that's, that's a lot, right? That's a lot to take in. It's a thing you really have to sit with because it's uncomfortable. It's scary. It's sad. It, it brings up a lot of difficult and negative feelings. And when you spend your life just avoiding negative feelings, which I've spent a lot of my life doing, then you, all you're doing is hiding it. You're not, like, you're not actually experiencing all of the positive stuff. You're just avoiding the negative stuff and bottling it up. And then sooner or later, it's going to come out as, you know, anger, as depression, as any of a number of things. Sometimes it comes out violently, right? I think a lot of I think a lot of what causes a lot of the violence in our society, particularly violence between men, is that we are taught to squash any negative feelings, but anger's okay. And so all of that pain, all of that fear, all of that sadness just turns into like a little ball of we don't know what to do with this. And then we call it, we eventually are like, wait, anger, I can have an outlet. And all of that stuff that we've crammed inside for years explodes outward. And often that means we hurt someone else. We hurt ourselves. We do both. So avoiding that, avoiding negative feelings is not a good way to live, certainly in the long term. It's also not a good way to live in the short term because it's just actually making you more anxious. And what ultimately we need to do is be able to feel our feelings and, and process them. Uh, there is a, a podcast uh, that my therapist recommended to me a couple years ago that I will just give a shout out to, uh, which is called The Healing Feeling Shit Show. And the premise of it is that it's emotional potty training for adults. Because she, uh, I'm, I don't remember the host's name, but she is a therapist and she likens the idea of feeling our feelings to pooping. Because if you refuse to poop... It's very bad for you. But if you just go and you sit on the toilet and you just you just let it out, you just, you know, you relax yourself and literally let it out, 
then you can move on with your day and your life and not feel terrible. And emotions are very similar. When we bottle them up, it's really unhealthy. But if we can just sit with them and see them and acknowledge them and then ultimately let them go, we'll, we'll be a lot better off. And so I was avoiding doing this because in part, also, like, I was avoiding the, the judgment, telling people, hey, I left that. You remember how I had a job and my face was in Time magazine and then I was a, a chief analytics officer and I did all of these fancy things? Well, now I don't have a job and I make videos in my shed on the Internet. Like, that sounds insane. Uh, and I don't I, I it's even like good friends of mine it's it feels weird to talk about it cuz i'm just like yeah i know i sound i sound delusional but i don't want the fear of what other people think to be the thing that keeps me from expressing myself and fundamentally this is for me a place to express myself and hopefully there are people out there who hear what i'm saying and can connect with it cuz the point of it isn't just you know, a private diary. I'm putting it out there because hopefully other people will will benefit from it, right? What, what I'm ultimately trying to do is help people. And I can't help people if I'm afraid of how everyone is going to look at me and think about me. Uh, so we're going to we're gonna wrap it up there. We actually went a little long because I forgot that I had paused my timer. Ooh, just smash the ukulele into the microphone. That's great for everybody. U ukulele? I think that's the, like, real pronunciation. Well, thank you, friend, for your visit today. Now it's time we both go on our way. The world will still be insane tomorrow. But don't let that fill your heart with sorrow. You can thrive in a desert. Just ask a saguaro. Please give to my Patreon. Capitalism is fun. Let's build a world that is good. This is a show for adults. Bye, friends. See you next time.